Well, my name is Nate. If you're a guest with us today, I'm the worship pastor here. I have the privilege of leading this great team. And I just want to give a shout out and just brag on this team. Most of this team, you guys come week after week and you're blessed. Most of the team that you see up here, they're volunteers. And so I just so appreciate what they bring week in and week out, and they're volunteering their time. Can we just say, can we appreciate our worship arts volunteers? We love you guys. Thank you. And it's good to have my good friend Daniel, Daniel Nino in the house today as well. So good to have you here, bro. So it's the Sunday between Christmas and New Year, and this is the Sunday that all the pastoral staff takes off and goes somewhere warm and sunny. And so they're like, let's get the worship leader to preach. So you're kind of stuck with me today. So make sure you come next week because our lead pastor will be back in the pulpit with you. But he is somewhere warm and sunny, and our teaching pastor is in Chicago. So there you have it. So one of my favorite hobbies, one of my favorite things to do is to hike. I love to go on hikes. We live in a great area for it. There's a lot of great hikes around here. I love to sometimes even get a backpack on my back and I'll stay out in the wilderness for a few days. In fact, this last summer, I think we logged around 30, 35 miles in a couple of nights on, on uh, North Manitou Island. And I love to do all the hikes around here in Michigan. In fact, um, when, when I first met my wife, she was a missionary in Thailand. And one of the things that she did was she would hike up into the mountain villages in Thailand and bring the Jesus film to people that had never heard about Jesus before. So she would kind of go with a team and lug all this equipment up there and show the Jesus film to people and then sleep out in the jungle at night, you know, with wild animals around. So I thought, great, when we get married, she's gonna go backpacking with me. We're gonna have this life where we just backpack and camp all the time. And I, you know, so first year, and I said, hey, you wanna go camping? And she's like, no, nah, let's do a hotel. Let's do a hotel, let's do that kind of vacation. I'm like, well, Kat, hold on, you like, you're used to this. You used to like backpack in the jungle, like with lions, or not lions, they didn't have lions there, but with tigers and all these other different kind of animals around. And she said, well, yeah, that was for Jesus, but for you, it's a hotel. <laughs> so it's good that she has her priorities straight, but I love to hike. And, and actually one of my favorite hikes is actually one of the shortest hikes that I've ever done. And it's in Woodland Park, Colorado, and it's up the side of a mountain. It's, it, it feels like it's 90 degrees up. I mean, it's, it's just straight up this mountain. In fact, for about half the hike, you've got to climb it because it kind of goes through the trees and then it breaks out into this kind of rocky area and you're actually climbing boulders and rocks to get to the top of this mountain. And when you get there, the view just opens up. And you can see Pikes Peak in all of its glory. And on a clear day, you can see the peaks behind that that you didn't know were there. And the whole kind of landscape opens up before you. And the atmosphere just feels different up there. And your vision is broader. And the air, to me, seems fresher. And you, you feel small in that good way. You know, when you climb a mountain, you kind of feel small in a good way. And church, guys, we're on the verge of a new year, and I believe God is calling us to a new perspective. And so if you would, we're going to kind of hike through some scripture today and kind of climb some mountaintops and see what the Lord would speak to us about today as we end 2019 and start 2020. A whole decade has passed, and we're on the verge of a brand new decade and what God wants to do through us as a people and through us individually. So we're going to jump into scripture here and look at some mountaintops today. So I want to start in the, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesies this, a lovely passage of scripture. It says this from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It says this, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains. And it will be raised above the hills and the nations will stream to it and many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us about his ways so that we may walk in his paths for instruction will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is a lovely passage of scripture. It's a prophecy full of hope. Isaiah wrote this thousands of years ago about the day that we live in right now. He said that there'll come a day where the kingdom of the Lord, that God's kingdom will be established as the, the highest mountain. It would be raised above all the other authority structures. And he says that all the nations, 
not just one nation, but all the nations would come and they would have a desire for God and they would want to climb the mountain of the Lord to see him and to know him and to, see, to know his ways. And my friends, we live in those days right now. Behind the depressing and the discouraging headlines, the kingdom of God is moving in power and in force. Yeah, the media is not going to cover it, but let me just tell you something. God is moving in power. There are nations where the gospel is closed by the government. The government says you can't preach the gospel here. Those are the very nations where the gospel is moving forward in power. We see all around us every day people coming to Christ in record numbers. More than at any time in history, the church is growing and expanding the, the kingdom of God. And so Isaiah is writing about those days that we live, the days that we live in right now. And I believe God is calling us to understand, to perceive, to see the kingdom of God, to see who we are in Christ, to see who Christ is in us. And that's what I hope today. I, I hope that, that today you are stirred up to hunger, that you are stirred up to passion, to know the things of God, to kind of climb the mountain of the Lord and to see him and know him. So I want to talk to you guys for the next few minutes about a few mountaintops. And as we follow the life of Christ, there's an, in, there's an interesting kind of moment in the life of Christ where he takes three of his friends up on the top of a mountain and something amazing happens. And I want to read about it, read about it in Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 27 through 43. It's a long passage, but it's an exciting story from the life of Christ. So I'm going to read this. Truly, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And about eight days after this conversation, he, meaning Jesus, took along Peter, John, and James, and he went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men were talking with him. These two men were Moses and Elijah. And they appeared in glory, and they were speaking of, of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So let's stop right there just so you can get the idea. Sometimes we can just pass over the scripture and not realize what's happening. So Jesus takes his friends up on a mountain. He starts praying. And for all you Star Wars fans, he kind of goes Obi-Wan Kenobi on his friends. I mean, this is what scripture says. His, his, his clothes begin to glow and there's this glory kind of radiating from him. And these two other guys, Moses and Elijah from long past, come and they're visiting with him. And that's what's happening. So let's pick up the story. So Peter and those with him were in a deep sleep. And when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who were standing with him. And as the two men were departing from him, Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud appeared and overshadowed them. They became afraid as they entered the cloud. And then a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. And after the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They kept silent and at that time told no one what they had seen. The next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met them. Just then a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you, look at my son. Because he's my only child, a spirit seizes him and suddenly he shrieks and throws him into a convulsion until he foams at the mouth, severely bruising him. It scarcely ever leaves him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Jesus replied, oh, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. As the boy was still approaching, the demon knocked him down, threw him into severe convulsions, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit healed the boy and gave him back to his father and they were all astonished at the greatness of God. What an awesome story. What an amazing picture of the, the power and the presence and kingdom of God coming in force in a broken world. But it starts on a mountaintop. So I want to kind of pull a few things out of, of, of this story. And as we climb the mountain of the Lord, just pull out a couple truths 
See, when I, when I talk about climbing the mountain of the Lord, I want to be clear. I'm talking about pursuing his kingdom and his presence. As a people of God, as a church, as those that are called by the name of Jesus, we are called to pursue him, to go after him. You know, he, he pursued us. He found us. We just got through with Christmas where we see Emmanuel, God with us. He went to great lengths to win our hearts. He took them to the cross, took them to the empty tomb. But now on the other side of that, we are called to now pursue him. We are called to pursue him. And as we climb the mountain of the Lord, number one, I want to bring this out. It promises transformation. As we pursue his presence, as we climb the mountain of the Lord, it promises transformation. See, the atmosphere in a high mountain actually changes our physical bodies. This summer when I was in Colorado, the camp that we were staying at for the week was around 9,000 feet up in altitude. And the very first night, I went to bed and I laid down, and every time I laid down, my heart started racing. So I thought, man, I had way too many Starbucks today on the way. Something's wrong. I, I could not sleep, and I kind of got up, and I said, well, this time I'm going to sleep. I lay down, and my heart, again, start racing. And I couldn't sleep the whole night. I thought, wow, there's something wrong with me. I think I need to go to the doctor. I'm, something's going on. And so the next morning, the camp people that, were, that lived there said they could tell I hadn't slept, and they were like, you didn't sleep last night, did you? I said, no, I didn't. They said, that's because you're not used to the altitude. Your body actually has to go through transformation to live in this altitude. And your, your heart is getting used to the, the different pressure. So your body actually has to acclimate to higher altitudes. You have to be transformed. See, I believe that, that coming into this year, I tell you what, I want to be transformed. How many of you guys are looking for transformation in 2020? Think about Peter, James, and John. They were never the same after this experience with Jesus on the mountain. They were transformed. They saw Jesus in a new way. They saw his power and his love and his light in a new way. Even Jesus himself, the scripture says, if we look at this passage we just read, it says that he was transfigured. Interesting word that we don't throw around every day. It means that his body was changed and he was radiating glory. There was a transformation that happened. So this is one of the reasons, church, that we pursue God. We need transformation. How many of you guys know our culture needs transformation? See, information is not enough. We need revelation. Information is not transformation. Transformation. Revelation is transformation. We have more information in our culture than we know what to do with. If I want to know information, all I got to do is pick up my phone. The other night I was lying in bed. And I thought, these are the random thoughts that come, me, come to me as I'm lying in bed. So y'all you all know how to pray for me now. I, I thought, I wonder how long it would take for me to get to the moon if I could travel at the speed of light. That's how much of a nerd I am. So, but all I got to do is I just grab my phone and ask Siri, hey, Siri, how long would it take me to get to the moon from here if I was traveling at the speed of light? And she told me, and I, I know you guys are wondering what it is. I forgot. So you'll have to Google it later. But we have so much information. We have more information than we'll ever be able to disseminate in a lifetime. We don't need more information. We need transformation. See, think about it like this. If you're in a village, let's say you're in a third world village and the well dries up in that village. And you know within days, everyone in the village is going to be gone. It's going to be dead if you don't get water. And someone comes along and says, hey, wait, hey, guys, just so you know, there's a new well about 10 miles away. You just got to hike to it and get the water. How many of you guys know that if I had that information, helpful information, I need the information, but until I actually hike the 10 miles to that well and get that water and experience it, transformation has not taken place. Church, the Church of Jesus Christ in America has been really good at getting information out. Friends, I submit to you today, we need to understand what it is to have transformation. See, we even have formation. Spiritual formation is amazing. We need that. Discipleship, discipline, all of that. As a, as a child, I grew up in the church. I had all the information. I had all the books. I had all the tapes. That's how old I am. And CDs. That's how old I am. And we had all of that, that information coming in all the time. We had formation. We had discipleship programs. But at 17 years old, I actually had to experience Jesus Christ for myself. I needed transformation. And transformation did not come for me until I experienced the revelation. 
experiential revelation is transformation. We need to encounter Jesus. That's why we come together to worship him. That's why we lift up our hands and we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When we worship, we, we sense the presence of God, and in his presence, we are transformed. Romans Romans chapter 12, verse 2, a, a verse that you might be familiar with today. Paul is writing, he says, don't be conformed to the image of this world, but what? Be transformed. We need transformation. As we pursue him, we have the promise of transformation in our lives. Number two, as you climb up a mountain, you climb the mountain of the Lord, it changes our perspective. See, on the mountaintop, you can see what you didn't see before. Uh, my favorite hike in Colorado, you kind of, you start down in the woods, kind of in this little valley and you hike through the woods and pretty soon the woods give away and you, you come out and you, you're just on these rocks and you can begin to see things you didn't see before. You begin to see things that you didn't notice before because you have a new perspective. See, in God, in the presence of God, in the kingdom of God, there's a new perspective that we can have. We started this, this morning by talking about Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 2. In Isaiah chapter 2, he wrote about the mountain of the house of the Lord, but we just fast forward about four chapters and we get to Isaiah 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah writes about an encounter he has with God that changes everything. I don't have the time this morning to read the whole passage, but basically Isaiah writes about a day he walks into the temple at that time in Jerusalem and he has an open vision of God that he can see the Lord in his words, he said, I, on the, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord lofty and exalted, high and lifted up. He goes on to describe the scene. It says that his robe kind of filled the temple. There was smoke. The presence of God was thick. He goes on to describe that there were angelic creatures around the throne and they were singing this song. They were declaring this kind of worship declaration. They were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, I read that a few years ago and I thought, well, how in the world could these angels say that the whole earth is full of his glory, especially if you read Isaiah? The first six chapters of Isaiah are full of what, what's going wrong with the world, how the people are rebelling against God. And we have the same thing today. Our headlines are full of what's going wrong with the world. How could these angels be in that place and look at the world and say, well, the whole earth is actually full of his glory. It's because they have a different perspective than we do. See, they're in the realm of God's presence and glory. So when they look at the world, they're filtering it through the fullness of who God is. They're filtering it. They've got a bigger picture of the end of the story. They can say the world is full of God's glory because they're seeing it through the filter of God and his power and his love and his move. You ever put a filter on Instagram? Sometimes I take pictures. I'm so Instagram illiterate. It's awful. My wife's all over Instagram. She, she's an amazing Instagrammer. And some, but I'll take these pictures and I'll put these filters on it. You guys know what I'm talking about. It clears up the whole thing that makes the picture sometimes look better. And that's what's going on with these angels. They're seeing through a filter. They're seeing the world through the filter of the presence of God. Now, what would happen if we could see the world through that filter? I want to remind us today that we, as new covenant believers, as believers in Jesus Christ, we've been invited. We've been invited to be, as scripture calls, seated with him in heavenly places. Wow, that's a pretty deep concept. God has raised us up to be with him positionally. So if we open our eyes of faith, we can see the world through the filter of what God is doing and what he is saying. Oh, I've done it this past year. I've done it many times this past decade. I've seen a headline, something tragic or something tragic has happened to someone close to me or something difficult has happened to my life. And I sigh and I go, oh, the world's so messed up. We all do it because we live in this reality, but we're also called to live in another reality at the same time. And that's the reality of the kingdom of heaven where we see the world through God's eyes. We see the brokenness through God's eyes. And we know the end of the story. We know that he'll make it all right at the end. See, what would, hap what would happen if we had that perspective that we could see the world through his eyes. You ever have this happen? 
You ever been depressed, oppressed, struggling, difficult day, difficult year, <laughs> difficult month, whatever it may be, and you get into the presence of God, you get into the awareness of God's presence. Maybe you just pray or you hear a song on the radio or a friend kind of puts his arm around you or her arm around you and begins to pray for you and you sense the presence of the Lord and you sense his nearness. Everything changes, doesn't it? Everything changes. It happens to me time and time again. I'll be so stressed out or I'll have anxiety or I'll have this or that and the other thing and I just get into God's presence and everything changes. Now, the struggle is still there. The issue is still there. The thing that I have to deal with is still there, but I have a new perspective. And I'll even, sometimes I'll be surprised because the struggle is still there. The issue is still there, but I sense something very strange welling up inside of me, joy, joy. It's amazing when you walk with God, how you can have joy in the darkest times of our life. The psalmist in the book of Psalms said it like this, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. See, when you have a presence perspective in your life, you can see your life like the angels see the world as full of God's glory. In any circumstance, in any situation, you can see your past redeemed. You can look at the cross and you, you can see your past behind that cross and know that it's redeemed. Even if for a season you have to deal with the consequences of some of your bad decisions, some of our bad decisions, even if you have to deal with the consequences of it, you can know that you're forgiven. You can know that ultimately God's going to redeem it all and turn it around. You can look at the future and you can see that it is certain. You can see that the king is on the throne and you can look at your present situation and see that it's full of glory in the everyday. That's the presence perspective. But it takes us getting into his presence. It takes us climbing the mountain, pursuing his presence and kingdom. See, people, people can look at the world and see doom and gloom, but with a presence perspective, you can see the kingdom moving forward in force and in power. And that's what I believe he calls us to. I believe as a church, he's called us to see the world differently than the rest of the world sees it. Thirdly, as we climb the mountain of the Lord, it challenges our presupposition. There's nothing like climbing a mountain that challenges some things that we supposed about ourselves. I remember when the last time I was in Colorado this past summer, I thought, well, I'm in pretty good shape. I, I climbed Mount Pisgah a few times with my kids. So I'll be able to, I'll do this, just run up the side of this mountain, no problem. And I start going and I've got some, I've got some, a little bit of, you know, I've got some power in my legs and about a fourth of the way up, I'm ready to stop and hurl, you know. And these teenage kids are, teenage girls and guys are flying by me. And I'm like, oh man, this challenged some things I supposed about myself and my fitness. But as we're on our way up the mountain, it challenges our presupposition. Let's go back to the text that we're talking about today, the transformation, the transfiguration on the mountaintop with Jesus. See, Peter, Peter thought that the mountaintop was all about him and his friends. When he sees Jesus transfigured and he sees Elijah and Moses there, Peter's like, sweet, let's build some temples and let's stay right here, Jesus. This is gonna be awesome. Let's hang out right here. See, religion wants us to keep us from moving into a broken world, but the gospel doesn't wanna be sheltered. It wants to be shared. The gospel doesn't wanna be sheltered. It wants to be shared. So when Peter said, hey, Jesus, let's make these these shelters for you and for, for Moses and Elijah, and let's just hang out and have a great camp meeting here. Jesus doesn't even answer him. He kind of just walks right by him, starts heading down the mountaintop into a broken world. See, if we encounter God's presence, be careful, because guess what will happen? Don't be surprised. We'll begin to move into brokenness. We'll, he'll begin to put us in places where we can be light and hope and life to somebody. He'll begin to, to, to open our eyes to the brokenness and the need of the world. As he fills you with his transforming power, he's asking you to bring that transforming power to somebody else. I don't need to tell you today that our culture is broken. I don't need to tell you today that there are people that are in, in pain and hurting all around us. Think about this young boy Jesus walks down the mountain and there's this young boy tormented, 
A father, a precious father who's tormented watching his son. Can you imagine watching your beloved son being thrown on the ground and and is foaming at the mouth and bruising himself, hurting himself, and there's nothing you can do. Jesus has compassion, moves into that situation and brings his transforming power and heals the boy. That's the power of the kingdom. And that's what he's asked you and I to do. See, religion wants to just kind of convince us, well, that was for that time. That's just in the pages of Scripture. Well, that was just for Jesus. Jesus did all that to show us how we could live as sons and daughters of the living God. See, don't be surprised that if we go to the mountaintop, he's going to call us into the valley and into hurt, into brokenness. And when that happens, you need to know that greater is the one who is in you and the one who is in the world. Come on, church. Come on, church. Fourthly, when you climb a mountain, it solidifies your position. See, mountains are a picture of strength and immovability. When I'm standing on top of that mountain in Colorado, you feel like you're a part of something that's so solid. It solidifies your position in the world So ultimately, as we climb the mountain of the Lord, God is calling out for us to solidify our position in him. And this is what he says. He calls us son. He calls us daughter. Let's go back to the text. If you remember, Elijah and Moses are hanging out with Jesus and Peter's there and he wants to build the shelters. But then something very interesting happens and it's a very clear in scripture. It's a very uh, beautiful kind of detail of scripture. It says that, Elijah and Moses disappear, and Scripture goes to great lengths to make sure this sentence stays in there, but Jesus remains. And all of a sudden, the very next thing that happens, we hear a voice from heaven. We've heard this voice several times through the life and ministry of Jesus, and he's once again, it's the Father affirming his Son. It's the Father saying, this is my Son, listen to him. And that's what God is saying over us today. He is affirming us today. One of the things that I love to do for my children I feel like I'm stumbling through this thing called fatherhood. And, but one of the things I do love to do uh, for my kids is, is on their birthday, I make sure, like, we give them the cake and we give them the presents and we have the pin the tail on the whatever and we have all that stuff. But one of the things I love to do is, is right before we have the cake, I'll, I'll put my hand on my son or daughter and I'll just speak out loud to their friends or neighborhood friends, family, whoever's there, and I'll, I'll begin to affirm them who they are, who their identity is, why I'm proud of them. Why? Because I want them to know that the voice of the Father is a voice of affirmation. And I want you to know today, church, that the voice of the Father is a voice of affirmation. We're going to celebrate baptisms in just two weeks here. And I love baptisms because at the baptism of Jesus, we see him going into the water, coming out of the water, and we hear a voice from heaven when we read about it in Scripture. What does it say? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Can I submit something to you today, church? That the moment you were baptized and all through your life, God has said to you, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. It's the affirmation of the father speaking over you. So even if your earthly father didn't say anything good about you or you have a strange relationship with your earthly father or mother, there is a father who is a father to the fatherless and he will speak words of affirmation over you today. See, on the mountain, it solidifies our position. Elijah and Moses, they disappear, and only Jesus remains. Why did Elijah and Moses disappear? Because Elijah and Moses only had a partial revelation. Moses, we, and they, they both had their own mountaintop experiences. Moses had a mountaintop experience on the Mount Sinai. He climbed up Mount Sinai. You guys probably know the story. Many of us know the story in here. It's when he received the Ten Commandments. While he was up there, he cries out to God. He says, God, I want to see your glory. And God says, okay, but you can't see my face. So in other words, Moses is allowed to kind of partially see God's glory. He's allowed to kind of understand his justice. He's allowed to understand his law, but he's not allowed to see his face. It's a partial revelation. See, in this new covenant, friends, we are called to a full revelation where we can look Jesus full in the face. We can see the fullness of who he is. We don't have to hide our face. And Elijah, he has kind of a partial revelation as well. He has two big mountaintop experiences in his life. 
I don't have time to, to open up the scripture and read it, but a lot, we see Elijah in his ministry climbing up Mount Carmel, a mountain called Carmel. And he's up on the top of that mountain. And at this time in the nation of Israel, the people had kind of gone away from God. They were rebellious. They were worshiping another God called Baal, who was an awful God, who was making them kind of sacrifice their children, just awful things. So God was really not happy about this. So he's like, Elijah, call the people to Mount Carmel and we're going to have a showdown. And there's a showdown between the God of Israel, the God that we serve, the God of creation, and this God called Baal. And there's like 400 of these, what they call priests of Baal or prophets of Baal. And these 400 guys were the worshipers of Baal and they were like crying. And, and Elijah said, listen, we're going to pray and whoever, whatever God answers the prayer is going to be the God. And these prophets of Baal are cutting themselves and they're dancing and they're crying out, Baal, listen to us, answer our prayer. Nothing happens. Then Elijah steps forward after all they're done with there, they're exhausted and worn out. And he just prays a simple prayer. And he just says, God, show these people that you're real. And many of you know the story, fire comes from heaven and consumes a sacrifice that was there. And so it's a great revival. Every person on that mountain bowed their knee and said, Yahweh, he is God. The Lord, he is God. How many know that's a pretty successful day in the ministry? I mean, that's a great day in the ministry. But he, but he has another mountaintop experience because right after that, Elijah falls into a deep depression. He, he, in fact, Scripture says that he tells God, I don't even want to live. I want to die, God. That's how deep his depression was. we got to remember, these guys that we read about in Scripture, they're just real people just like us. So he goes into this deep depression and, and God's trying to deal with him and he climbs up another mountain called Horeb and he, he sits on this mountain and he hears the whisper of God. He begins to hear the voice of God and he begins to understand that, you know what? Maybe success is found on Mount, Mount Carmel, but sonship is found somewhere else. See, our success says nothing about our position. How we behave says nothing about our position. We are positionally the children of God. And that's a powerful thought that helps us in our lives. But again, even Elijah only had a partial revelation. Because as you're going to see in a moment, we're called to a different mountain where God isn't whispering anymore. He's shouting his affirmation. It's no longer a little whisper. It's a shout of affirmation to his sons and his daughters. So we're not entering into 2020 trying to strive for a relationship with God. See, that's what religion says. Religion says you've got to kind of somehow work for God's affirmation. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The work has already been done through Jesus on a hilltop called Calvary. And when he said it is finished, it was finished. And that relationship was given to you. Positionally, you are a son or a daughter. So we're not entering into 2020 trying to strive for a relationship with God. We are moving into the new year coming from a relationship with God. So here's all the mountains that we've talked about today so far and one more that we're going to talk about at the end. We've got Sinai where Moses had his revelation. We have Carmel and Horeb where Elijah had a revelation of God. We move to the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John where they saw Jesus and everything changed at that moment. Then we move on to the life of Jesus where Jesus goes to Calvary and he does the finished work of Calvary on the cross which leads us to the last mountain, Mount Zion. I want to read from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 to 24 to finish our time together. The writer of Hebrews says this, he says, you have not come to a mountain that could be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. We all know what mountain that is, don't we? That's Mount Sinai. Writer of Hebrews is writing to New Covenant saints, the New Testament saints, the Church of the Living God, and says, you haven't come to that mountain. Let me tell you the mountain you've come to. He goes on to say, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus 
the mediator of a new covenant to a sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The, the writer of Hebrews says, you've not come to these other mountains, you've come to Mount Zion. And Zion is a representation of the, the kingdom of God, kind of the, the final and the full revelation of the kingdom of God that we have in Jesus. So the writer of Hebrews says, when you come to Zion, you've actually come to, Christ, to Jesus Christ, but not only Jesus Christ, you've come to God the Father, and you've not only come to God the Father, but you've come to the saints. You've come to the church. You've come to a community. You've come to a family. See, over at Sinai, we hear about God's justice, but we're never able to see his face. The Old Testament saints had to hide their face from him. Even as they worshiped today, even as they sang like we did today, holy, 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 they had to hide their face. But over here at Zion, we don't have to hide our face anymore. We with unveiled faces behold the glory of God. We don't have to hide our faces. We can lift our hands and we can lift our hearts and we can lift our countenance and we can say, holy, holy, holy is this Lord God Almighty. We're not confident in our own holiness and our own worthiness. No, not at all. But we know there is one who did a finished work on a hilltop called Calvary where we can look at him full in the face because of his work, because of what he's done, because of the sprinkled blood, the writer of Hebrews says, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, better word than any other, any other blood. We can come with boldness and with confidence as sons and daughters, and that's what I encourage us in this year, 2020, to move forward with confidence. See, at Carmel, we come to Mount Carmel and we, we see God's victory, but we never really hear his voice. Then Elijah climbs up to Horeb and he, he begins to hear the whispers of God. He begins to hear his voice, but he doesn't have a name yet. And then we move to the name, Transfiguration, where Jesus is revealed where the new covenant is set up as a higher and a better covenant than the old covenant, where, where the revelation of Jesus is lifted and exalted above the revelation that Moses had and the revelation that Elijah had, this being this is the final revelation of who God is. The writer of Hebrews continues to encourage us. In the past, God spoke in many ways through the prophets and, and through these other things, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, whom he made heir of all things. So transfiguration begins to change things, and then we come to Calvary where we see the love of God and the justice of God all wrapped up in one. When Jesus said those beautiful words, it is finished. So now that a nation, a nation of sons and daughters that have a right relationship with God through Jesus could come to Zion, where the fear has been swept away, where we can see God fully, we can look at him in the face, and we no longer have to veil or hide our faces. This is the finality of the finished work. The grace of God compels us to desire him. Church, the grace of God compels us to desire him. Religion says it's all about rules and, and regulations and, and all of this, but, but Jesus said it's all about relationship. I'm not talking about some kind of, kind of sloppy grace. I'm not talking about some kind of hyper grace. But when we see him and we see his love, there's a desire that comes in inside of us, a desire that wells up in us. We don't need the drink anymore. We don't need the drug anymore. We don't need the website anymore. We don't need the unhealthy relationship anymore. We don't need the gossip anymore. We just want him. That's the work of transformation that he does in us as his people. And that's what he's calling us to in this year. That's what he's always been calling us to. So where, may I ask you today, where are you today? Are you at Sinai? Do you kind of understand the justice of, of God, but maybe you don't understand that he is your God, that he loves you, that he died for you? Are you at Horeb today where you need to hear the whisper of God? You need to just hear some affirmation. Maybe you're at Carmel. You're experiencing a great victory or you're, you're really winning in life and you're really killing it. But you know what? There's something missing because you're trying to find your identity in success and it will never satisfy God's calling you to find your identity in sonship and daughtership in Christ. Maybe today you need to come to Calvary. Maybe you've heard the message of the gospel all your life and you've never really made Jesus Lord of your life and you need to look at Calvary and say, I need you, Jesus. But I want you to know today that through Calvary, God is calling us to Zion and we were never made to be satisfied with anything less than God 
himself. And that is the call. That is the call today. And that is the call moving forward in 2020. I want to invite the worship team to come as quick as you can. See, in these last days, guys, God is calling a generation of people to know him. Our privilege as Americans will never satisfy. Our dreams and our goals, as good as they are, they will never fulfill us. Over the next few days, many of us will sit down with our spouses or sit down alone with God and we'll come up with goals for a new year. It's a good thing. Kat and I will do that. But those goals and dreams were never made to fulfill us. See, God is calling us up the mountain to seek something richer, to seek something fuller, to seek something deeper. And it is God himself. As you look over the last year, 2019, look over even the last decade as we near a new decade, certainly, certainly there were moments of valleys where there was darkness, where there was struggle. And certainly there were moments of great victory. But God was always there through every one of them. And so we can be sure as we look forward to this new year, this new decade, we can look forward to this new decade and we can know You know what? There's going to be some moments that are struggle. There's going to be some valleys. There's going to be hardship. But we can be sure that the God who is the great one, in fact, he said of himself, I'm the great I am, is going to be with us. And certainly there will be mountaintops experiences where we we meet with God and there's a sense of intimacy. There's a sense of everything is right with the world. And even in those moments, We give glory to the great I am, the great God who is with us.